Yeah, simple, taxes your friend, that's kind of an oxymoron for most people, isn't it? So, uh, you know, we take a look at taxes, and our friend Benjamin Franklin once said, there are two things that are certain in life, and that's death and taxes. Now, that's hard to be friendly with death, isn't it? <laughs> so, but, but Will Rogers, I think, actually capped it very well when he said, you know, the difference between death and taxes is that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. <laughs> <laughs> So today I'd like to spend a little time going over a few things. First off, let's evaluate your relationship with taxes because, you, you know, most of us don't do well with that. Uh, and determine if your record keeping is helping you in determining things that your return on your investment for your time, money and, man and energy. And then we're going to talk about some things that the IRS looks at. They may be helpful to you in preparing your return and keeping your records. So hopefully you'll leave this and, and have some good information that you can apply. So there'll be time at the end for questions, so hold them and we'll, we'll try and get to as many as we can. Uh, first off, I've gotta be honest with you folks, I'm not a tax expert. I know a lot about tax, I'm a tax professional, and I help a lot of people with what I know. I'll, I'll make that more clear a little later on in the presentation. And also know that all tax professionals and accountants don't agree on, how, on certain things. What I tell you today, your accountant may say, that guy's out of his, you know, he, he can't do that. And that's okay. The law's written in words. Words can be interpreted differently by different people. So just know, this is my opinion. And you may get other opinions from your tax professional or from your mechanic or from your stylist, whoever, <laughs> whoever you're getting tax advice from. <clears throat> so what is a tax? Well, a tax is money that we pay to a governmental agency that allows them to pay for the things that they provide to us. So now that we understand, at least that's what we're talking about. I'm real big on words. If you don't understand the definition of words, you can't understand the concept. So we have to look at how do we keep our taxes down? Do we try and uh, evade tax or avoid taxes? Well, av av avoidance of taxes is legal. Evading taxes is illegal. <laughs> the difference between the two is about five to 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think it is best said by a judge learned at hand that anybody can arrange their affairs so that his taxes are, shall be as low as possible. He's not bound to choose that pattern, which pay, best pays the treasury. There's not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. So we had a lot of discussions about that in the last several months, but just know you can do it to your advantage as long as you know the rules. So when we look at who enforces the tax law, we look at the IRS. Most people read this differently and those same letters become theirs. <laughs> okay. Now the theirs isn't the IRS, the theirs is Congress, but so the IRS's job is to enforce the taxes and also to collect the proper amount of taxes. It's one thing to assess the tax, it's another thing to collect it. And that's what they focus on doing. And they, it's not as ugly as you might think, but they want all the help they can get because obviously the taxes fund the government. Not enough, but you know, again, uh, taxes too high, too low, not going there either. Um, so how the IRS really gets you to pay more taxes is through confusion is one way. <laughs> Uh, and, and the other one is fear. So <laughs> confusing is what language they use. The, uh, the IRS and tax law gives a whole separate idea. It's a whole different language, kind of like attorneys and doctors. You know, you kind of go, yeah, yeah, and have no idea what it says. Okay. The other thing is the, is the sheer volume of the content we're dealing with. Um, just to give you an idea... This is the Internal Revenue Code, okay? And this is the 2007 version, which does not include the Affordable Care Act. So it's increased and, and it changes. Just to give you some concept, this is volume one of two volumes. <laughs> and to put it in perspective, if you read the Bible from cover to cover, Genesis to 
um, revelations. And some of you who have done that know that's a formidable task. The number of words you've read there, you multiply times 11 to give you the internal revenue code. Which is why I tell you I'm not a tax expert. <laughs> I have no intention of reading the entire thing, but I will tell you this, if you ever have insomnia, it's great for putting you to sleep. <laughs> and also know this one rule that the big print giveth and the small print taketh away. <laughs> The other thing is, is the tax law changes on a regular basis, and it changes in a number of ways. We have three branches of government, and so the legislative branch, Congress, enacts the law, and then they go around changing it very frequently. The executive branch, which is the IRS, will try and enforce the law. They'll interpret it the way they want to interpret it, and then we get to decide, do we agree with that interpretation or not? And if we do not, then we take it to the judicial branch and let the judges decide. So based on that, the tax law changes constantly. And some of them are big changes. We had a big change in 86. They're talking about a big change now. We'll see you know, what happens with that. So how do we take care of us? Well, the first way is to gain some awareness. Coming to things like this is always good. And so you can then kind of key in on what's going on for uh, and, and ways that you can help yourself save taxes and and again be friendly with it. The other one is having systems in place. So let's talk about your awareness. Awareness is kind of understanding things. Most people, um, I didn't get into the fear so I'm going to back up a slide. The fear is, the IRS is really good about fear. Because I, I do frequently, when I talk, say, we're going to do a word association. And when I say this word, I want you to tell me the first thing that comes to mind. And the word is taxes. And I am overwhelmed with negativity. I know you're surprised about that. <laughs> <clears throat> but what the reality is, is you fear what you don't know. IRS plays on that because they go, oh, I don't want to take that deduction because I might go to jail. How many of you thought that, you know, I don't want to do that because I might go to jail. Okay, I want you to do something with me. Okay, repeat after me very quickly. Okay, you ready for this? Repeat after me. The IRS can't eat me. <laughs> okay, they can't take away my birthday. Okay, now doesn't that feel better already? <laughs> <clears throat> so understanding how they work and getting somebody to help you do that will, will take away some of the fears. The other things you will notice is that the big court cases, the, the Willie Nelson, the Wesley Snipes, the, you know, this grandmother got her house taken away, which by the way, you only hear one side of that story. You know, the fact is they've been talking to her for two years before they did and she wouldn't respond to any of their correspondence. But they always come out sometime in February or March, which is a, coincidentally coincides with you filling out your tax return. And you go, oh, gosh, they did that to Willie. I don't want that to happen to me. So you go, I'm not going to take those deductions, you know, because the IRS won't like it. Well, guess what? The IRS isn't working for you. I know that comes as quite a shock. So we, we raise our awareness and then we also put systems in place because systems will help give you information to help defend you against the IRS, have better records. You'd be surprised the number of people that keep records for the IRS and not for themselves to manage the business and then manage return on investment for your own business. Return on investment just means you're getting something back from what you're putting out. So we can do that in, you know, we need, you can't manage what you don't measure. So setting up the systems, you need to do it right, get it set up right, because it, so many people go, yes, I'm gonna use this software, Quicken's good for everybody. And it's not. It is, it'll only give you good information if it's set up correctly. And, you know, some people just use it as a glorified check register. It's okay, it's better than nothing, but it's not, may not be what you need. The, th the other thing is, is make sure that whatever systems you have, you'll actually use. Some people go, I need a computer. Great. For some people, that means a yellow tablet and a number two pencil. For others, it means a Mac. And for those others, it means a PC. Make sure that's something you'll use and that it gives you meaningful information. So what's meaningful? You know, am I making a profit on it? Does it give me a return? Does the money I'm putting out 
give me money back on my on the equipment I'm buying and also on the expenses I'm use I'm paying for. So, well, let's take an example of that. Your car. What is the return on investment on your vehicle expense? Well, that's a good question, but if you'll think about it, it doesn't tell you much. But it's one of the largest things the IRS looks at because it's one of the largest things that's on your tax return for most small businesses. And so we go, well, okay, what am I using my car for? Well, okay, the return I get on my use of my car is I come to educational things like e for e and when I come to an educational thing, is the use of your car really part of your cost of being here today as well as whatever you've paid to be here? Yes. So maybe we need to factor that in. How about your networking? Your vehicle is used for your networking or for your meeting with people. Is that really an advertising expense or is that really a car expense? To help you manage, it's really part of your marketing cost. And in order to be able to determine if my marketing is paying off, shouldn't you be able to determine how much that real cost is in what you're spending? So, and the other thing is, is how does it work? You know, will, it, will the IRS target it? The IRS understandably targets big numbers. And if your auto expense is a big number, that it's, you can be sure that's one of the things they look at because most people don't keep Good car records. I know you find that hard to believe. <laughs> but uh, then the other thing they look at is travel, because, gosh, I know some people actually travel for personal use. Can you believe that? <laughs> and entertainment. Again, there's specific documentation you've got to have. Just know that you're doing it. Let me give you a very specific example. I talked to a gentleman. He's in the construction trades. He drives 35,000 miles for his business. That translates, if you're using standard miles, to about $20,000 deduction. For a small business, that's a big number. IRS goes for big numbers. If you're going hunting, is it easier to shoot at a moose or a mouse? <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, but in reality, probably I'm making up the percentages, 60% of what he does has to do with the actual providing of his services. So of the 20,000, 12,000 is really the cost of providing the service, the cost of sales. Shouldn't that portion of the auto expense be used in calculating, am I making a profit here? If you have it in vehicle expense, it's not giving you any of that. So be thinking about how you can best measure and what you're measuring. Also, for education, for networking, for marketing, those could be advertising expenses. Now our $20,000 deduction went, okay, $12,000 went in direct cost of sales. We have some in our marketing. Now that $20,000 deduction comes down to three, four, five thousand. dollars $5,000. Is that as likely to be looked at by the IRS? Chances are not. So... The IRS looks at you and you go, well, wait a minute, that's not what this form says. It says auto expense. Yes, it does. But if you're keeping records for your management and not for the IRS, it's perfectly okay. The only thing the IRS gets to decide is, is it deductible? It doesn't matter whether you call it orange juice or auto expense. As long as it meets section 162, which is... There, in general, there should be allowed as a deduction all of the ordinary and necessary expenses incurred in carrying on a trade or business. Most of us carry on very well, but we, where do you put it on the return also makes a difference. The smaller numbers get less attention. And understand, you're not evading the tax, you're using them for management purposes. You don't want to keep a set of books for management and a set of books for taxes. They don't like you keeping two sets of books. <laughs> so, leave you with this one thought, and that is, most people ask the question, can I deduct it? Good question, just not a great question, because it only has two answers, yes, no. Why don't you ask the question, how can I deduct it? How does this help my business? How does this enhance my income, lower my expenses, bring me new clients, meet new people? It's a whole lot more useful than can I deduct it. And so one last thought for you is accounting is really nothing more than scorekeeping with money. If it's scorekeeping with money, 
this must be a game. <laughs> and if it's a game, we can have fun and be friendly with it. But the other thing, if it's a game, we can win. And I encourage you to take some of this information and apply it so you can win. Are there any questions? <laughs> talked about um, how you keep track of your mileage and what account you associate that with. Uh, so I'm one of those oddballs that I keep track of my mileage. And, and so the question is, uh, I've been calling everything an auto expense. Sure. And what you're saying is that depending on what I'm doing, the purpose I'm using my car for, I might call it an advertising expense if it's for marketing and so on. So logistically how do i tr how do i mark that in my book and how do i what are the steps to tracking that properly well again it's having good systems in place steve good, great question and again it's going to be different for everybody it's how you keep it up some people will keep it electronically on their phone other people will have a manual mileage you can you know you can at the end of every week color highlight it and go back and count them up but it's a, whatever system you will use is the one you should have. So, I mean, there's not one. What works for you may not work for Helena or, you know, or, or Lori. How do you, how do, you do yours? Um, I'm, I'm old fashioned. IT for me means the internet thing. Okay. <laughs> 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 just, just saying, Tim. I, so I, I, I write my mileage on a post-it note and take it in and put it in a spreadsheet. Okay. And you mark which account is going to be posted. Right. Okay. Right. So. Um, that. Going to the deductible thing, uh, many of us are service-based companies. How would we go about deducting our services if we use those services for a nonprofit organization? Well, you feel good about them. Okay, so you feel good about providing the services. But the thing is, when you gift services, you really have no out-of-pocket expenses for it. You have lost opportunity, but you haven't included the income to be able to take the deduction. Okay, because we work on cash. No cash in, no cash out. So you go, well, that doesn't seem fair. You get to deduct your actual cost of providing the service, Thad, but not anything other than that. And that's a real common misconception. Thanks for bringing that up. Other questions? Either I've totally confused you or, <laughs> you know, you, you're understanding some things. Yes. What do you think about those apps that track your uh, business mileage and do you recommend one? Um, I have not used one, so I can only say I've heard a number of people that have tried Mile IQ that they're real happy with. Uh, has anybody else used one that they like? Is there Mile IQ? Okay, so it seems to be a consensus. Mile IQ would be a good thing. <laughs> Based on my extensive research. Survey. That's right. <laughs> Andy, uh, many of us probably go to lunches and those kinds of things and call that networking, but uh, meals, I think, are um, deducted at a different rate than marketing. So how are some other ways we might deduct some meals? Well, yes, always a good question. And, you know, other than cheat, um, <laughs> unfortunately, that's written into the law that you get to deduct 50% of your meals. So, you know... Uh, one strategy I have heard some people use, which of course as a professional I cannot recommend, is if you and I go to lunch on a fairly regular basis, you buy one week, I buy the next. That way we're at least, you know, splitting the cost. But, okay, so with that, you know, I would say it's in the law, the, the way you work around it. Meeting costs, for instance, if you go to a meeting that includes a meal, you get to deduct the whole thing because it's a meeting. So again, just pay attention to that. And if it's part of the meeting, you're golden. Okay, well, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Did, did anybody become friendlier with their taxes from being here? I feel much better. Feel much better, okay. It's group therapy, so. <laughs> thank you very much.